Hey there! Welcome back to another episode of The Lost Film Files. No, this series is not lost. I've decided to bring it back. Uh, it was always uh, something that I was going to continue. I just had uh, some things that had been going on in my life, uh, namely work, where I just haven't really had the time to uh, do another installment. But uh, I enjoy doing these videos a lot, so I'm probably going to uh, make an attempt to uh, create the time to be able to do these videos. But anyway, let's get started. So let's start with Boo, the Bureau of Otherworldly Operations. So Boo, the Bureau of Otherworldly Operations, was the title of an American CGI action comedy film being made by DreamWorks. Uh, originally having a June 2015 release date, DreamWorks Animation decided to move the release date in November of 2014, a mere seven months before release in order to avoid competition with Pixar's Inside Out. Now, Inside Out's a film I've heard about. I've heard a lot of good things about that movie, but I actually have not gotten around to seeing it. Uh, it's just never really been that high on my list or been much of a priority for me. Maybe if I do a Pixar marathon, maybe then uh, I might check it out and I might share my thoughts on it. But uh, there's a lot of other movies that I'm more interested in that I haven't gotten around to seeing. So, Boo was then removed from the release schedule and was never added back in. Uh, there have been rumors that it has been moved back to an in-development status, but that doesn't mean much uh, because there really hasn't been a whole lot of movement when it comes to this actually getting finished. So, it seems like, more than likely, it's just been cancelled. Now, there's a little bit, there's definitely some updates here. On January 29th of 2019, Alexis Wanneroy, former animation supervisor at DreamWorks, uploaded on his Vimeo account an animation reel showing footage of Boo, as well as Larry Kins, another canceled DreamWorks animation production. On February 9th of 2019, Wanneroy uploaded a pre production reel showing additional animation for both canceled movies. Uh, and so they actually, there are some clips that are available for it. This is the logo for the film. Um, looks rather, uh, generic and unassuming. And I mean, the title is always kind of silly. The like, boo, like get it. Cause they're ghosts and you know, my guess is they're trying to do some kind of ghostbusters thing, but with kids or something, you know, or for kids or both. Um, now, what's interesting about this is that now that I mentioned it, they're trying to do Ghostbusters, Melissa McCarthy actually was in the cast. She uh, was the voice of Watts. Um, Seth Rogen, I guess he also voiced a character named Jackson Moss. And Bill Murray was also in this too as Drake. F interesting, right? I mean, <laughs> there was a time where... <laughs> Melissa McCarthy and Bill Murray worked on a Ghostbusting movie that wasn't Ghostbusters before the Ghostbusters uh, reboot or, or remake in 2016. Uh, and this is the one that got canceled. You know what? Uh, they canceled the wrong movie. <laughs> they canceled the wrong film featuring Melissa McCarthy and Bill Murray that features ghosts and people who are, are busting ghosts. Uh, so, the plot of the film was supposed to be, it was an action comedy, which follows two bumbling apparitions who find themselves in an extraordinary afterlife adventure when they jo join the Bureau of Otherworldly Operations, the Ghost World's elite counter-haunting unit, and ultimately must face off against the planet's greatest haunter. Now, apparently... This was like Ghostbusters meets Men in Black, or Ghostbusters meets R.I.P.D., which, that's not good. Like, that movie was an absolute uh, tire fire. So, anyway, uh, there actually is some other stuff, like there is an activity book that was supposed to be released uh, that uh, never actually got released. This is going to be the book for the activity book, where you can learn to draw these 
really ugly looking characters from the movie. Um, this is what the poster was going to look like. Uh, then there is a, a beach towel. A bit of beach towel art. Uh, uh, it was a beach towel that actually I think did get made. It looks like it did actually get made. It just wound up somewhere. Like a flea market or something. So, uh, there's an official website for the movie. We'll check that out. But here is an animation reel. Did you, did you get it? Come on, people. Show me the goods. Wow me! This is my station! Around here, you need a ticket. What are you? You want to ride the train? Ticket? Ticket? Who got the ticket? Wh All aboard! Woo woo! Wha ah! Lionel, bite down hard, would you? I, I don't want to strip the screw. Holy cronies, we were just flapping our jaws about you guys. Get him! Yeah! Hold on! Ah! Lionel, bite down hard, would you? I don't want to strip the screw. I, it doesn't look like it really would have been that good, but it would have been better than Ball Busters. At least Bill Murray looks like he's trying. He sounds like he's trying in the little bit that I that you see here of his role as Drake. Uh, and then you have this website, which I don't think still exists. No, it doesn't. The website's no longer active. Um, but yeah. Um, some interesting, uh, interesting stuff. So they, yeah, it's one of those, uh, it's one of those things where it was this or the emo emoji movie. Somebody was like, it was this or the emoji movie. Pick your po poison. I would have rather this got made and released than the emoji movie. I mean, that had a talking piece of shit in it. So yeah, voiced by Patrick Stewart. But anyway, uh, boo. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, go boo-hoo over, you know, boo not existing, but, you know, it, it's it's one of those things that it, there's, it, it's a little bit in, intriguing, though, especially the, the Melissa McCarthy, Bill Murray connection. So the next one is the Black Cauldron. Now, this is one that I've heard about. Uh, I actually haven't seen the film yet. I, I've heard about its reputation. I knew that it, it had a pretty infamous reputation of scaring kids and Disney disowned it and wasn't really, in, you know, uh, that happy with the film and it was a bomb and so on and so forth. But uh, it's a movie, though, that I still want to give a give a shot one of these days because it does seem like a different kind of Disney animated movie. Like the Horn King is like legitimately intimidating and scary. And uh, it seems like there's an edge to it that isn't really present in most Disney animated films. So when the 1985 Disney film Black Cauldron was initially released to a test audience, many sequences caused some negative reactions due to its graphic nature despite the film being targeted at older audiences. When Jeffrey Katzenberg joined in, he ordered that the film be cut down and reanimated for continued sake, continuous sake, despite the fact that it was very late into production by that point. Twelve minutes of footage were reportedly cut out of the movie, and clues to where scenes were possibly deleted can be seen in the final film, as the quality of animation appears to decrease in some scenes, as well as jump cuts in some cases. What's really too bad about this animation, these deleted scenes, is they look, I mean, they're gruesome, but as a horror fan, uh, it's something that reminds me of Bernie Wrightson. It reminds me a lot of that kind of stuff, and and uh, it's stuff that I honestly would like to see. I would like to see the deleted scenes. Uh, I would like, you know, they were considered to be too graphic for, for young audiences, but... Um, I can definitely handle it. I, th I think we can handle it now. So some of the most notable cuts include uh, the scenes of the Horn King's undead army, which look a lot like the uh, skull, the skeleton army from Army of Darkness. 
the cauldron born pouncing on and killing some of his henchmen, with at least two of them dissolving in a very graphic manner in which their skin bubbles and melts off their bodies, leaving a pair of skeletons behind. Another notable scene uh, was that was cut was that of a man's throat being slashed with a sword. Both cuts caused jumps in the film's soundtrack. Now, recently, some production cells of the Melting Men were obtained during an online auction, uh, and a couple years later, the cells were inserted into a reconstruction of one of the film's scenes, along with shots of, from the trailer that weren't present in the final film. Producer Joe Hale is said to own a full black-and-white uncut version of the film, although he has never publicly released any scenes from it. It also has been theorized that the deleted scenes or additional full cuts may be stored at either Walt Disney Animation Studios or Disney Studios, although this has never been proven as anything more than speculation. Knowing Disney, even back then, I would be surprised if they still had the footage. So, um... Here is a recreation of one of the scenes in Return Removed Shots. I mean, look at that. And that admittedly is pretty, pretty shocking for, you know, for, for a kid's, uh, for a kid's cartoon, you know, for, for a Disney cartoon. Um, there's some other, you know, clips and stuff, but I, I'm probably, I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, yeah. Uh, it would be, it would be cool to see those scenes. It really would be. Um, I think Disney, I think heard, I heard something about them doing a Blu-ray. They're going to do, I think it's a, uh, uh, one of those, uh, Disney club exclusives or something like that. Um, we'll see if they even bother trying to get the deleted scenes. Cause it seems like it's a film that's gotten a little bit of a cult following over the years. So, um, yeah. All right. The black cauldron, uh, deleted scenes. Uh, just, I definitely wanted to cover those because I always, when I first heard about it, it's like, oh, that's pretty interesting. Pretty cool. Then we have Blood Circus. This movie seems like an absolute fucking riot. This is one of those films that, well, you know, would only be made in the 80s during the peak of cocaine uh, abuse. So, uh, Santo Gold's Blood Circus, produced in 1985 by Santo Victor uh, Rigatuso a.k.a. Robert Bob Harris, is a sci-fi horror movie about man-eating aliens from Zoran invading Earth and their clash with professional U.S. and USSR wrestlers. I'm not making this shit up. Rigatuso, playing the character of Santo Golden, is seen recorded at the Baltimore Civic Center, performs a song before the film's climactic brawl. The lyrics, however, have nothing to do with the film and are about R Rigatuso's Santo Gold business. The film starred a few professional wrestlers from WWF, which is now known as WWE. It was made on a budget of $2 million. It was promoted through infomercials for Rugatuso Santo Gold mail order jewelry business. In 1987, after two years of editing the film, Rigatuso was having trouble finding a distribu distributor for it and decided to rent a few local cinemas and screen it himself over the course of one week. Although he only held a few showings, and the film didn't gross anywhere near its $2 million budget. Screen bags were also given out at screenings as a promotional tie-in, each side of the bag sporting a long poem about Blood Circus, with one of the sides containing a coupon for a free diamond ring from Santo Gold. After 1987, Blood Circus wasn't shown publicly, and thought to be lost for years until a secret screening at the Alamo Drafthouse Ritz in 2014. In 2008, the Santo Gold Company announced on their website uh, that they had rediscovered a 35mm copy of the film and were looking for producers for an official release. No producers signed on, and the original 35mm film reels were eventually offered up on eBay in 2011, with a starting price of $21 million and a buy-it-now price of $750 million, or an option to buy a partnership in the film. No bids or partnerships are made and the reels still didn't sell. Yeah, because that, but that's a ridiculous amount of money to ask for this movie. That barely nobody has fucking heard of. Except for wrestling fans. 
and and people who are fans of exploitation and or, or people who saw articles about this uh on on the internet and and saw the trailer and and the and the, and the clips that are that are available online so two and a half years later in late december 2013 the reels for the film were offered up on ebay by a different seller the highest bid fell below the reserve price so the reels were once again unsold. In April of 2014, the film would finally be screened again at the Alamo Drafthouse Ritz in Austin, Texas, as a part of a secret screening. A year later, around May 27, 2015, an LPP uh, 35mm print of the film uh, was put up for sale on eBay. However, unlike the previous listing, this print only has, an only, uh, only has a buy option. The print was available th for $3,500 in June of 2015. I'm surprised nobody bought it then. Because this is the kind of thing that screams vinegar syndrome. Like this could, I could see this easily being a vinegar syndrome release. If they could, you know, uh, missed opportunity for the guys, you know, I don't, I don't know if they were, st they were a company then though, but it's a missed opportunity for any uh, horror or sci-fi uh, boutique company to not have gotten the print for $3,500. So future plans for releasing the film remain unknown. The only footage of Blood Circus that has surfaced online are brief snippets as seen in an old Santo Gold commercial. So this is a handbill for the movie. Uh, so it's a little bit of uh, some kind of... Uh, it's an advertisement for the film. Uh, where let, let's, let's read this. So we, 10 electronic and remote... 35 millimeter, uh, 35 millimeter motion picture cameras on a cast of thousands with angels and angel music, aliens, real blood, heads landing and popcorn, fleas, Santo Gold wearing 30, 30 pounds of gold, singing his hit song, Santo Gold, and blood, comedy, tears, the most brutalist, the most brutalist? That's, that's not, that's not a word. Okay. Most brutalist, hard packing, hard packing? What is this, a gay porn? I'm just saying, hard packing, thundering landing, edge sitting, tear jerking, comedy, sci-fi, action, horror, everything movie ever filmed. Nothing to compare it to in the industry, so original. Wrestlers actually had to get stitches and lost teeth. The blood was real. We get it. He said it was real earlier. The, light, the lighting, DP, directing sound, etc. was superb. We are currently purchasing over half a million dollars per month in the U.S. on national TV, promoting blah, 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 blah. Um, interesting that, so, I, I guess you could actually get, like, free a free 10-minute pre preview of the film, a beta or VHS, expecting $200 million gross. Ha, ha, ha. Back then, that would have that would have been the highest grossing film of all time. Uh, I love how it says uh, it's a multi million dollar class, uh, not triple A, but A A A A A feature film. Uh, it was a miracle of Blood Circus, and I love this blurb too. It's like we invite the major studios to battle it out in the ring for the rights to this movie. Sounds like another. This also sounds like a film that. Speaking of battling things out in the ring, sounds like a film that uh, Dark Force should get their hands on. Uh, but anyway, uh, Bud Circus is is absolutely insane. So uh, let's uh, let's actually uh, check out these infomercials because these these infomercials are infamous. They really are. This one's like fourteen minutes. A little bit long. But you get the gist of what Blood Circus is. Just cocaine craziness. Pure cocaine fucking craziness. Or brilliance, I don't know. Maybe it's a bit of both. Coming <laughs> with with two M's. You know, I I if you misspelled coming soon. 
Blood Circus is coming soon. Ask your theater manager for your free screen bag now. Supplies are limited. Ladies and gentlemen, what if anyone actually has a screen right bag? What you are about to see is a phenomenon that's sweeping across the country. Some people wonder what the 24 karat Santo Gold process has so here you go. with wrestling. He's fucking, it's inf infomercial, you know, <laughs> for fucking Santo for Gold. Example, the Santo Gold Heavyweight Championship Wrestling Belt is awarded to the winning tag team in the new science fiction space wrestling movie comedy, Blood Circus. There is actually a rock singer called Santo Gold, who sings his song, Santo Gold, in the movie Blood Circus. You will see and hear Santo Gold perform a little later on. <laughs> Look at this Gold. fucking shit. But first, ladies and gentlemen, our goodwill message <laughs> for today. Say something nice and kind to the very next person you see. Hey, facilities where they this is some good the advice. For the famous Santo Gold Jewelry TV offers. The highly trained staff examines the thousands of customers' names on the computer sheets each week. Like, if you Mail saw this shit late at night, you'd be like, am I fucking high? It was, it was, it was a fucking fever dream. Each department is All right, this is a little boring, this part. Um, I'm going to try to find more footage of Blood Circus. Looks like there isn't any more footage of Blood Circus in this part. So, there's more here, though. Remember, each Santo Gold kit comes with a complete 100% money-back guarantee. And you can examine them at no risk for 30 days. And if you are not 100% satisfied, you can still keep the... Is Santo Gold even still around? This genuine Santo Gold men's or ladies Santonian free. That's right. You have a 30 day free examination period. And if for any reason you are not satisfied, you can return. Can't even keep the camera straight on the guy. And you can still keep <laughs> Keeps fucking drifting. Like unisex Santonian. Can't even afford a fucking free. tripod. Just look at it. Regardless which kit you order and whether it's for your personal use to sell or just to give away to your loved ones. That's a thought. Just think, your entire year-round gift shopping can be all right here, complete with luxurious cotton-lined gift boxes for birthdays, anniversaries, weddings, get well, and just about any occasion. And each piece carries the Santo Gold 10-year warranty. How much you bet? It's not even real gold. Tag, plus <laughs> the story, history, and documentation papers, and the 10-year assurance policy, even against lost or theft, and for any reason replaced free. So when you give, wear, or sell Santo Gold products, you have the Santo Gold Seal of Excellence. Oh, not a seal of approval, of the seal Gold of excellence. The computerized serial number. The Santo Gold trained shipping staff will carefully pack okay. and inspect each Where's order the blood circus footage? Out. I don't, I don't six one, six care one. about if this. If the lines are busy, they will clear up momentarily, so okay, try to call again in a few moments. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we proudly present in person Santo Gold. There are no words. Santa The space wrestling movie. He sings like a washing machine? Oh, by the way, do you know why the pregnant lady <laughs> went into the pizza parlor? Was she hungry? Is that supposed to be a compliment? He sings like a washing machine? Jesus. I think that was the guy in Escape from New York, right? Who got like a bat with a nail, with nails on in his head? I just, just what? The fuck? I 
I mean, this movie's probably gonna be awful, but I, I, I still want to see it. Because of just how absurd and surreal this whole thing is. Is this where the inspiration for the Yeti comes from? You know, the Yeti in WCW? Oh my god. be one of the weirdest fucking things that has ever happened in wrestling. I'm not saying a lot. I love this. We got gold! <laughs> is, the guy thinks he's so cool being like, we got gold! <laughs> we got fake gold! He's, he's, he was fucking coked out of his mind. Oh, Clarence, do you know why the lady went into the pizza parlor? They had free delivery? No, this one wasn't pregnant. Jesus. What the fuck? What's the movie called? Now you have a nightmare. He can tell me. You sure? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you want to hear it? Uh-huh. Bud Circus. <laughs> now that you have seen the fantastic making of Santo Gold and have seen Santo <laughs> Gold himself as he performs in the wrestling picture Blood Circus, I'd like to keep our total... I wonder if that number still works. And repeat the offers to you one final time. And remember, we will... Okay. There's, there's no more, there's no more uh, Santo Gold, uh, there's no more Blood Circus fo footage. So... <laughs> Oh my God! Okay, this is this is an interesting bit of uh, uh, info. Uh, Alamo screened the film back in 2014. There's always a chance it'll show up again. It's just a tricky film to screen because of the litigative nature of the person who created it. Oh, apparently Santo Gold doesn't want people to see his movie oh, that he thought was going to make 200 million dollars. Um. Even though, if my impressions are corrected, the reason he doesn't own this is because it was seized by the IRS. Oh. Uh, so it's the IRS that's involved? Can you wrestle IRS and then get the rights <laughs> to Blood Circus? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, shit. So anyway, that's Blood Circus. Then uh, the next up is Bobby's Girl. So Bobby's Girl is an unfinished animated film produced by Ralph Bakshi and John uh, Kay, uh, who you may know from Ren and Stimpy and other projects and other headlines. So Bakshi uh, saw the potential in John Kay and decided to work on a project with him. The film was to be a parody of 80s teen films like Sixteen Candles and The Breakfast Club. Which sounds like a fun concept to do an 80s uh, parody of 80s teen comedies or coming of age movies but with animation when Bakshi pitched the film to Jeff Saganaski the president of TriStar Pictures uh, at the time he was given $150,000 for production of the film the funding prompted Bakshi to move back to Los Angeles however the duo was evidently unable to produce by the, the film by the time Saganeski left TriStar which forced Bakshi to repitch it to TriStar the new executives didn't see the appeal, however, and ended up cutting off his finances. Later, Bobby's Girl was reworked into a potential primetime series called Susie's in Love, but this also attracted little attention, leaving the entire project dead. 
Now, apparently, artwork for the film can be seen in Bakshi's book, Unfiltered the Complete Ralph Bakshi, as well as on his official website. Now, to be honest, I, I would like to pick that book up sometime because I'm a big fan of Ralph Bakshi. Uh, I love American Pop. I think it's a really underrated film. And I think he's a really great animator and, and, and one of the best storytellers when it comes to the animated format. So I, I th that sounds like it might be a really cool book. So here we have some photos. So um, this is a really, all, this isn't very big. This is, I believe, from uh, his website of some test footage. Uh, it's a preliminary sketch that he worked on on his website. Uh, this is from uh, Lynn Naylor's uh, blog. A little some concept art. Uh, we have some more. This is a layout artwork by uh, Jim Smith. And uh, this is more artwork by John Kay. It was, uh, I believe it was leaked. It was found in some leaked thing. Yeah, it was found in a leaked uh, art book for Spumco. Uh, then, then you have more artwork by John Kay, which is uh, from, I think, the same leaked source. Uh, production artwork by John Kay, which is also found in another leaked, leaked art book. Found the same leaked art book. And, uh, this is the concept art. Uh, Dottie Loves Bobby. From Bakshi. So, eh, might have been interesting, uh, but I can kind of see why it didn't get made because probably at the point that uh, Bakshi was was working on it, or trying to pitch it, uh, the '80s teen dramas had already taken their course. It are it had already been something that audiences were getting a little tired of, and studios were also uh, experiencing diminished returns with. So, and also animation, animated films weren't doing that great unless it was Disney or uh, exceptions like Amblin uh, with uh, An American Tale. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, Bobby's Girl. Next one is Broadway Brawler, which is a lost, unfinished Bruce Willis movie. So Broadway Brawler is the title of an unfinished film starring Bruce Willis and Mara Tierney. Willis also acted as a co-producer. The film was set to be a family-friendly romantic comedy set in the world of hockey. Willis played the part of Eddie Kapinski, the titular Broadway brawler, a retired hockey player romancing Mara Tierney's character. After 20 days of shooting, the production was halted as, as the result of Willis's dissatisfaction with director Lee Grant, co-producer Joe Ferry, and director of photographer, photography William Fraker. They were all fired! Along with an unknown number of cast and crew members, in an effort to salvage the film, which had already cost, uh, which already had uh, cost the studio, fifteen to seventeen million of its twenty-eight million dollar budget, Dennis Dugan was brought on by Willis to replace Lee Grant as director, but filming never resumed. The failure of Broadway Brawler had some interesting consequences. Bruce Willis was left with legal problems with the Walt Disney Company. To avoid this, producer Joe Roth persuaded him to accept a three-picture deal with Disney. To offset the loss on Broadway Brawler, Willis took his next role as Harry Stamper in Armageddon at a greatly reduced salary, $3 million instead of his then-expected $20 million. Willis reportedly replaced Sean Connery in that role. Which, that's interesting that Sean Connery was going to play Stamper initially. Uh, the other two films in that deal were uh, The Sixth Sense and The Kid. So this just sounds like it's another instance of Bruce Willis being a fucking asshole. That's really what it sounds like to me. He didn't like the direction the film was going. He didn't want to sit there and just do his job. So he decided to throw a bitch fit. And because he was a big enough star at the time, he could get away with it. And he got all these people fired. Cost the studio $15, $17 million dollars hired his own director and then the studio was like fuck you bruce willis <laughs> and then the movie never got made and then because he cost the studio so much money he was then strong-armed into doing this three-picture deal with disney serves you right bruce and the thing is about bruce i like a lot of his films i'm a big fan of bruce willis 
uh, when it comes to uh, his characters, when it comes to a good number of his films. But I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of him as, as a person. It seems like, from what I've heard, he's just an asshole. He's cantankerous. He's not really, you know, that nice to his fans. And yes, some fans can be really annoying and cross the line. But at the same time, I don't think that's an excuse to be, you know, a raging asshole. So it's really a shame. I think fame honestly also got to his head. And you can see it with stuff like this. This is the kind of thing that happens when somebody uh, has an ego the size of a skyscraper. The size of Nakatomi Plaza. So that's Broadway Brawler. The next one is Cannibal Holocaust. Uh, there is a apparently a piranha scene in the film. Uh, there's a still that exists of it. The, the 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 image is not very very big. It's in, it's incredibly small. I don't know if I could zoom it in anymore. Yeah, it, it's it's not the best in terms of uh, image quality. Uh, but apparently there was some rumored piranha sequence for Cannibal Holocaust that was uh, uh, either lost when it comes to the footage or wasn't actually shot. So for those of you who don't know, Cannibal Holocaust is a controversial 1980 Italian film directed by Ruggiero Diodato. The film tells the story of a missing documentary crew that was filming cannibal tribes in the Amazon. New York University anthropologist Harold Monroe, Robert Kerman, is sent in on an expedition to track down the missing crew. He manages to recover the film's lost cans of film, which an American broadcast station was, wishes to broadcast. Upon viewing the film reels, Monroe is appalled by the disturbing actions of the film crew and urges the station not to broadcast the documentary. The film's use of found footage was unique at the time and is considered to have influenced the found footage genre of horror films seen in such films as The Blair Witch Project. Now, Cannibal Holocaust aroused a great deal of controversy, not only due to its graphic violence, but due to the on-screen killings of live animals, sexual assault, and other and snuff film allegations that managed to land the film's director in jail, Italian jail, on obscenity charges and possible murder. Uh, yeah, he was actually taken to court, and he had to have like uh, the uh, effects artists speak to the jury and let them know how certain effects were done and that it wasn't done for real. Like the woman that had a, a post through her mouth, she was sitting on a bicycle seat and it was all in effect. And the actors who originally signed uh, uh, something in their contract where they would be away from uh, Hollywood and be away from uh, the media for a certain number of time to create more authenticity for this movie they had to come in and, and also say that nobody was actually killed or eaten on the set of Cannibal Holocaust. So the film uh, has been banned in Italy, Australia, Norway, and many other countries due to its content. Although since uh, although a good number of those bans have been list lifted over the years. Among the many gruesome scenes in the movie, uh, another one was scripted that is commonly dubbed the Piranha Scene. In this scene, a single Shamatari warrior injured in battle was to have his leg amputated by the warriors of the Yanamamo tribe. The tribe would then tie the Shamatari warrior to a log and lower him into piranha-infested waters, slowly being eaten alive by the fearsome fish. Filming for the scene did commence, but was never completed due to the piranhas being difficult to control. No shit. I mean, they're fucking piranhas. Do you think they're going to be good actors? Do you think the piranhas are going to take well to your direction? No, they're ravenous fucking piranhas. They're, they're not going to fucking work with you. And the film's crew's underwater camera was malfunctioning. The scene was scrapped entirely and only production stills exist. It was rumored that the scene was included in several obscure foreign video releases, but this has been proven to be false. The whereabouts of the surviving footage, if any, is unknown. Now, so there's a lot of people who are like, of you know, they really want to see this. Like, out of all the sequences of a lost uh, footage, like, this is one that they really want to see. And I get it in some ways because it's piranhas. But another way, it's Cannibal Holocaust. And it's like, what, what really was, was there going to, what, what, what really was going to happen there? 
Was this actually going to be a guy fed to piranhas? No. Uh, they weren't actually going to do that. But then again, I don't know, considering this fucking poofy. <laughs> but, uh, really, uh, the, in all seriousness, I think the scene, even if it was shot, wouldn't be that impressive. It would just be another scene of, you know, savagery in a film full of savagery. So I, I don't I don't think it's really it's not it's not a scene that's really that high in my list. I just I just want to talk about it because it's piranhas and it just shows you how crazy the filmmakers were for this movie. They thought they could get piranhas to act accordingly on camera and, and follow directions. Uh, so, yeah, that's a cannibal Holocaust scene. And then you have uh, the uh, fourth ending for Clue. So the 1985 film Clue is famous for having three different endings, with one shown in different theaters during its initial theatrical release. Some theaters would announce which ending would be shown, while the, uh, and others would not. Uh, the, while the three endings were released on VHS and DVD, there is a fourth ending that is yet to be seen in any cinematic form. The fan site Cluedo fan gives a description of the fourth ending. It would have revealed Wadsworth, the butler, to have been the killer. Uh, and that he had poisoned the other character's champagne. The elderly evangelist would appear once more and wrestle with Wadsworth before the police arrived. For telling some of the stories to the police, Wadsworth escapes and drives away. He would then hear the German shepherd growl from the back before the film faded to black. This is an ending I would like to see. Because if you don't remember, uh, the butler in Clue was played by Tim Curry. The legendary Tim Curry. So the ending was scripted and filmed, though for some unknown reason it has never been shown to the public. Interestingly, it is in the novelization. Yeah, I remember reading the novelization and I was like, the butler did it. And, you know, it's one of the endings that they had in there. It was also in the movie storybook, which is said to have actual screen caps in the fourth ending. It was also rumored that the fourth ending did air on occasional TV showings, but this, is a, this has yet to be proven. And th these are some images of uh, the storybook. I'm surprised they don't have like better quality images now nowadays. Like somebody could really easily get the Clue storybook and do higher quality scans. Um, but yeah, that's that's a fuzzy looking image of Wadsworth with a gun, and then you have the chief uh, who is apprehending Wadsworth. Sorry, I didn't mean to mess with your eyes there. So that's him apprehending Wadsworth. So on that note, uh, I am going to call it for this installment. Uh, we got through the letters B and C. Uh, next up, we're going to go through a few more letters. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this installment of Lost Film Files. And until next time, see you later. <laughs>